<clears throat> good morning. Oh, <laughs> good morning from Fiji, actually. Um, welcome to the afternoon session in Porto Madryn, and thanks for joining us. My name is Carol, and I am from Fiji, um, a little island in the Pacific where we are waking up. Um, and today I will be leading this session. So we've got a great lineup of presentations that touch on gender data, addressing challenges during the pandemic, delivering solutions to humanitarian organizations, and so forth. As practiced, there are five minutes allocated at the end of each presentation for a question and answer session. So if you have any questions during any one of our wonderful presentations, please do put these in the question and answer chat. So our first speaker today is Laura. <clears throat> Her presentation is titled Creating Gender Data in Open Maps. Laura is a geospatial engineer working in the intersection of FOSS, open data and development. She currently works with a social enterprise to support teams in using data. Additionally, she is a Youth Mapper Regional Ambassador, where she supports chapters locally and in her free time volunteers with FOSS communities. So welcome, Laura. Eighteen months later, and I was still speaking on mute. <laughs> um, That's okay. Yeah. Right. So I can, so, you can go ahead. Yep, I'll just remove myself quickly. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, it will be a quick one. I'll be sharing a bit about creating gender data um, when you're talking in the in the geospatial space and also just a quick intro on what gender data is as well. Um, as introduced, my name is Laura. I am joining in from Nairobi. It's a warm evening here. Um, yeah, I won't go into that since <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think Carol I shared a bit about myself there. So uh, I believe a lot of uh, individuals, organizations are working uh, towards progressing uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, 2030 is just here when I guess we'll be measuring progress to see how far everything um, is at. Uh, and I guess from, from my title, uh, someone might assume that maybe uh, when you're talking about gender data or even gender in general, that uh, we are only focusing on one SDG, SDG 5. But that's actually not the case because um, gender inequality is something that cross cuts all the other SDGs. So uh, when you're looking at um, quality, uh, quality education, which is SDG 4, um, it is important and necessary um, and also very crucial to understand how gender intersects with that because um, development is not equal and also our problems are not equal, meaning um, some, uh, some, some, um, some of some of the challenges and problems that uh, as a society we face uh, in today's world uh, if you look at uh, those challenges disaggregated by sex uh, or gender then you we get to notice uh, um, a few differences here and there a uh, quick example probably also still on quality education you're looking at um, access to ed quality education in the sub-saharan african region um, looking at how gender intersects with this is that uh, in, in a lot of communities in rural Africa, there's still um, women and girls who are um, forced into early marriages um, and are good th things like female genital mutilation, which affects their access to uh, education. And uh, by understanding these social norms, then we are able to see how um, gender intersects with this and also how we are designing solutions uh, that we hope will progress the goals. Same thing also when you're looking at things like healthcare, uh, access to water and sanitation, and basically all the SDGs. Uh, so it's very essential that we are talking to talk about gender issues and um, also see how they affect everything else. Because ideally, also with the goals of with the goal of the sustainable development goals being that we didn't want to leave uh, people behind. If we uh, uh, attempt to have a generalist solution, then at the end of the day, we'll end up leaving groups behind and such groups may, might include groups of women and girls. Um, and over the years, it's been proven how mapping um, 
is crucial uh, when we are addressing the SDGs or even when we are um, sort of trying to uh, create and craft solutions uh, to all these challenges. And um, it's also because that uh, looking at how uh, problems are faced, uh, they're sort of also geographically distributed, meaning um, a gender problem in, in say, uh, the city that I'm in, in Nairobi, is not uh, the same gender problem in New York. Um, and that like is cross-cutting also all the other issues. So if you're looking at education and looking at how like the challenges that women and girls in Nairobi face uh, to access education, they're not the same probably in another city. And even looking um, at a smaller level or at a lower level within even the same country, um, uh, problems within uh, urban settings are not similar to those in rural settings. And that's how mapping comes in uh, and why it's also essential to uh, consider mapping when you're crafting all these solutions. And obviously, um, a lot of areas where these problems are um, sort of uh, the highest in terms of uh, their impact, uh, there's, um, in access, there's minimal data for use. So therefore, there's also a huge need for open geospatial data um, to be available so that many organizations and individuals who are working to actually create these solutions have what they need. And now even going down further than what is gender data, it's basically data that is uh, collected and presented uh, and where sex uh, is the primary and overall classification. So it's actually not data that's being collected for say another purpose and then later classifying this data just to show um, this is uh, like these are the number of cases say for women and these are the um, number of cases for uh, the, the other other sexes so it's actually data that's primarily co collected with sex as the overall classification and uh, uh, since this data is collected and presented in this way, then uh, once analyzed and visualized, we are able to uh, reflect gender issues. So we are able to see how um, um, issues are actually affected by gender. So say, for example, if we have collected um, household data, we are able to see and compare uh, between the sexes and see um, how things are defined, uh, how, how, how sex actually defines these issues. And the last definition is that it accounts for uh, stereotypes and social norms and cultural factors. So uh, just even a, an example that I was sharing earlier in the education space, when you're looking at education in rural Africa, uh, you have to understand the cultural and social norms that uh, might affect um, or might bring out these gender issues in general. So yes, say for example, you are collecting um, accessibility to school, uh, to primary school education. And yes, you have done your, you have collected data through surveys. Um, it, it is important to understand even uh, as you're designing those uh, your data collection methods and you're looking at the data, you already understand some of the social norms and cultural norms that uh, would affect uh, how your data would look like. And just like uh, any other data sources, uh, it's inaccessible, it's minimal. So uh, looking at uh, what's available in national and international databases, only um, half uh, of, of what's defined as the gender-related indicators are missing, enti are missing entirely, or others even lack data that's, that is disaggregated by sex uh, entirely. So. Um, from actually looking at the sub-Saharan region, only 15 African countries have this data available, and only around 40% is um, available um, that's already dis disaggregated by sex. And, and then also looking at the other regions, it's only five of, uh, can, uh, of countries in these regions that have this data available that's usable. Um, and now, um, how then does GIS and mapping and map uh, and maps in general come into this? Um, so when looking at at uh, at all these databases and what's available, um, 
most of them are collected from organizations and governments uh, who collected this for various purposes. And then we also have data portals where um, individuals have shared what's available. Uh, and also what now I'll be sharing more is on open mapping. Um, so how can we explore uh, crowdsourced mapping to be able to generate this data? Because for a lot of work or what's known to be publicly av available is uh, what's there from open data initiatives and portals, mostly from um, international organizations like the World Bank, and also from other organizations uh, working in the space, in the development space. So um, we did a project last year in the health sector uh, and um, why we focused on, on SDG3 and, and the health space in general, it's because out of all the SDGs, I think uh, it's the one where most of these, uh, or I'd say 80% of its indicators are, uh, highlighting issues that women and girls face. So um, looking at healthcare, uh, still uh, out of out of the nine targets that we have, uh, six of them um, are actually on female-based healthcare. So from maternal health to child mortality, which obviously affects mothers, um, sexual and repro reproductive healthcare, and access to quality healthcare in general. Um, and how gender data would look like in health is first, uh, it's just health data that is disaggregated by sex. So uh, general statistics are broken down based on sex. So say for example, even uh, with COVID-19, uh, are we getting numbers on the preval prevalence in, male, in males versus uh, the prevalence in females, uh, other common diseases like uh, HIV, uh, which also are affects a number of regions like the African region, uh, it's very essential to understand um, that distribution. Then uh, also um, it can be seen as data that measure conditions and events that affect women and girls only face. So uh, when you're talking about maternal health care, it's purely uh, falls on women and girls. Um, so there's still a number of, uh, of cases when it comes to mortality and um, things like uh, the number of maternal deaths that can be due to uh, quality, uh, the access to quality health care, uh, which is also something that can be um, seen as largely affect, affect, affecting countries in the region as well. And then lastly, uh, as I shared earlier, is also access to quality health care. And the last bit, I think, is what comes in a bit important to maps because uh, it then extends and we can, can be translated to, to infrastructure, meaning uh, we can map this and see the distribution as well. So uh, for the project that we did last year is that we uh, then looked at uh, open maps that are available. And mainly we are looking at the OpenStreetMap database um, and uh, looking at what's available on the map which other data sources are available that we can use to enrich the map. Uh, so um, looking at them, <laughs> at just the data even before uh, starting to uh, add data to OpenStreetMap is that uh, largely healthcare facilities have been added to, to the platform, but uh, the, what was just indicated were general healthcare services. So uh, yes, you see there's a clinic, but you don't, uh, for a user, an end user who I'd say is any person looking for a health facility, they are not able to see the um, services broken down. So, and even uh, where, in cases where services are available, it, uh, it was rare to find where uh, maternal healthcare services had been highlighted, meaning um, a map would be sort of useless uh, in cases where, um, as a user, say, for example, a pregnant woman looking for a clinic to uh, be able to access services X, Y, and Z uh, that are uh, only offered by certain specialists, I was not able to do that unless I visit the healthcare facility and find out, uh, I'll get that information from there, which can be a bit limiting when looking at platforms, especially digital platforms for use. Um, so basically what we did is that we, uh, did then uh, a manual import into OpenStreetMap where we're updating our facilities with uh, information 
or attributes uh, on, on uh, facilities that offer maternal health care and also uh, female best health services. So uh, from gynecology to um, general uh, maternal health care, like, uh, like um, antenatal care and postnatal care. Uh, and you can see even in some regions in the country there, especially in the northern and coastal regions, there are like no uh, healthcare services at all. And this could be then useful to uh, different groups of people because um, one, uh, say for uh, individuals and organizations working in the space, they're able to see issues that affect women and girls. So, because uh, at times <laughs> it's easy, a lot of, a lot, when it comes to a lot of gender work, um, things to tend to be in theory so and um, but I, t I think with such data and being able to show the problems that that exist then you are able to uh, for to first share uh, the challenges and then also makes it easier for everyone else to understand uh, what's being shared and that also now informs advocacy so in as much as we are sort of fighting to to get equal rights and equal access to services and facilities, uh, what can we show to back up our advocacy? And hopefully that um, all this is used to inform decisions and uh, advance the goals in general, because uh, we'll not just be solving gender inequality, but also things like healthcare in general. Um, but uh, even with this, there's still a lot of gaps. Um, um, the, First, I'd say availability of data, because uh, most of the time when people are looking at gender data, uh, we're looking at qualitative mostly, and also just quantitative data that's maybe collected uh, over long periods of time. So at times you find that um, data is collected in 10 year rounds, uh, just because it's by international organizations, which can be uh, limiting in a way, uh, generally. Uh, also, a lot of gender data just started being collected in 2018, meaning uh, from uh, 2017 going backwards, there's no historical information that's use usable, which also just uh, limits and also uh, limits uh, the power of, of the data that you have and also the analytics that we are producing from that. And um, Another thing is accessibility. So uh, a lot of organizations in the healthcare sector still um, sensitive about sharing information and data, uh, even if uh, some standards are shared. Um, so accessibility is still an issue. So in some cases, data is available, but not shared. Um, and then there's also generally a lack of uh, standards that are usable across regions and even um, um, at the international level. So it's sort of, uh, since it's, I'd say, a space that uh, it's still being explored, uh, there's still a lack of standards that people can refer to. Uh, meaning it, maybe it's possible to work at different levels, but if you're working on a larger scale, then it becomes a bit tedious to work with that data. Then the second thing I'd say that is a gap is the lack of the, the level of disaggregation. So mostly we get, you'll get data um, uh, at the, mostly at the national level, so, uh, and regional level. So maybe you'll find statistics uh, about the African region and also some statistics uh, at the country level, uh, but nothing lower than that, which can also now not be useful when you're implementing solutions on the ground, cause uh, geographically, the national level is still a bit uh, sort of huge to work with. Um, and then lastly is also on uh, the data that's available. It's unclear um, on how, how updated this data could be and also the status uh, that it comes in. So which, which still goes back to the lack of uh, gender data collection standards. And then lastly, there's also uh, really slow adoption by, by governments and organizations in using gender data generally when they're working on different aspects. So uh, yes, you'd find someone working on, on healthcare, governments working on healthcare, but still slow adoption and in understanding how gender intersects with that and um, how gender data could be useful, which also now means uh, little to no investments when it comes to gender financing 
uh, or when it comes to uh, implementing gender um, gender issues when we're looking at uh, developing our solutions. So <laughs> from my experience, I'd say it's still a lot of growth um, and uh, still a lot of opportunity for more individuals and organizations to come in, uh, especially in the mapping sector. Um, so um, I, I guess as uh, professional specialists in the area, uh, I guess for our projects and our data collection processes, then it's essential to also now consider um, creating this data at lower data low administrative levels, so meaning at least lower than the national level, um, then also sharing the need for gender data. So uh, by mostly uh, showing how gender intersects with all these issues and um, sort of also showing how it can be, uh, how it can inform our data collection processes. Uh, so at the end of the day, we have more data for use, uh, which then ideally would lead to the creation of more gender data and with more gender data, more uh, organizations and individuals in the space who are advocating for, for the use then have a lot of um, resources to use. And lastly would be on the development of, of standards for collecting gender data and also now the adoption of this by governments and organizations in their processes uh, such as censuses and surveys. Yeah, and that's it from me. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> um, probably just move that quickly so we can have your question and answer session. Um, thanks so much for your talk. That was really, I would say inspiring <laughs> because here in the Pacific, we don't really talk about gender um, or reflect gender in data or maps. Um, so there's a couple of questions coming in now. Um, the first question is, how does the Kenyan government, especially the health agencies, view the importance of gender data? Do they use gender data? Do they proactively collect gender data? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I'd, I'd say yes and no, because <laughs> uh, even for the for the data imports that we were doing, the data was collected by, by the Ministry of Health, but uh, it's something that was done in conjunction with a number of international organizations. Um, but then, um, so at least there was that initiative to make the data available and even to release the data with an open license. Uh, but then in terms of views, I wouldn't say there's been much of that so we it's, it's sort of hard to prove that actually that that data was used to inform decisions because uh, there's still um, a lot of issues in terms of accessing quality healthcare um, especially when you're looking at female best healthcare services and then also since that initial collection there's been no update to the data so um, seems like something that was done because of the uh, project or initiative that was back then but uh, there's still not, uh, I'd say, meaningful efforts in uh, progressing that and using the data for to inform the decisions. So, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, there's another question. Um, are there examples of open data sets that you work with that handle gender well, gender well, or do all of them need improvement? Uh, from so far from me, uh, I've, I've not I've not seen as many, um, but generally looking at a lot of infrastructure data. So um, when you're looking at, if you look at the at the SDGs, then um, and look at each and see um, how each cross cuts with with gender and if they have any sort of in on on the ground infrastructure, then. Uh, we can see how, how that could be helpful. Uh, a good example would be something like uh, the education space. Uh, healthcare, I think, is the best in terms of looking at how gender data intersects with that, but uh, but also looking at the gen uh, at the education space, sorry. Uh, there's also things like um, the ag agricultural space, looking at uh, farmlands and ownership and financing and initiatives. 
uh, and all that. Uh, there's also a project that was done by a youth mapper's chapter uh, in Africa, in Sierra Leone, on mapping access to ex ele electricity, um, which also intersected well with uh, gender data. So um, I'd say almost all, but a lot of what I've seen uh, is useful is uh, where infrastructure is dependent. Uh, but other than that, also there's just usually gen general statistics which we collect uh, per admin level that's also inavailable in that. Uh, so you uh, like in terms of gender data availability, so you'll find that a lot of statistics that are available uh, for regions, but are not in a special format or uh, data that's currently not usable um, by people in the GIS space. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a difficult challenge to overcome. <laughs> um, thank you yeah. so much for your talk. Um, I'm sure people will be able to find you maybe at the social gathering later if they have any more questions. Um, so thanks so much, Laura, for joining us. And we will take a short break before we begin with the next presentation with Selena. Thanks, Laura. Thanks as well. Bye. Bye.